I'm Tom Bilyeu. Welcome. We are going to be talking about Kamala Harris making the rounds. I want to talk about her economic policies, Mark Cuban going on the All In podcast, and people's response to that's been interesting. Hurricanes are ravaging America, and I'm told that we have a Tesla surprise. Let's hear about it. Drew, as always, welcome. I'm excited, Tom. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Nice. All right. Jumping right into it. I want to get the brewing stuff out the way. Economics. You love inflation. You're a big inflation guy. It has... <laughs> I love inflation. That might not be the accurate way to represent my stance, Drew. Uh, yes, but it is certainly a topic I think a lot about. It dropped to 2.4 in September, down from a most down from a pandemic high of 9.1 in June 2022. Love I know it. a lot of people still see prices up. A lot of people still see their pockets not stretching mm-hmm. as much as they used to. I know you have this in take on inflation isn't just about rising prices, it's the dollar amount itself. How do you feel about this news that inflation is actually quote unquote getting better? Well, so inflation getting better would just be good news all around. Anybody that makes something like that sound like bad news, that that's very problematic. But the thing that I try to get people to understand is that inflation is not rising prices. Rising prices is a result of inflation. Inflation, literally, the reason it is called inflation, boys and girls, is because you're inflating something. So the question is, what are you inflating and why is it bad? You're inflating the money supply. I want to be very clear about that. Guess what inflates the money supply? Like crazy, debt. Guess what else inflates the money supply? Actually putting fiat currency, just by, literally fiat, by decree, Uh, into the system to pay for the debt that already was inflationary. And so we are in this horrific cycle where you're just adding money, adding money, adding money to the system. And what that does is it robs buying power. So boys and girls, when you hear inflation, what you should think in your mind is theft. I've been stolen from. If it's actual inflation, if it's rising prices, it's very different. So I want to be very clear. And I get it. This is nuanced. And people, the world abhors nuance more than nature abhors a vacuum. But nonetheless, you have to understand the difference between the two. So prices are going to rise for a whole host of factors. But ultimately, inflation, which is the thing that drives the increase in prices more than anything else, is a separate phenomenon. And if people don't separate those two things, you get all the political mumbo jumbo that we're living through right now. Copy. And just to put a pin in that, the government does not troll private interest prices. So that is a free market problem. Um, Well, so hold on, because this is exactly what Kamala Harris is talking about. This is the mm -hmm. thing that ultimately disqualified her for me as a candidate, literally until about two weeks ago. I wasn't sure which way I was going to vote. I still might cast a a protest vote. We'll see, because I think the vote is going to be so close, it might matter uh, from a popular election standpoint. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think she at like a deep and fundamental level, I do not think she understands the drivers of the economy. And you just at at a moment where you have the debt that we have and you have the interest payments that we have, uh, you cannot have somebody that is fiscally illiterate. So the DOJ is deciding how to break up Google. I know that monopolies are bad on paper, but can the government figure out how to make a company more viable? Like, what does that mean if you had a company and the government wants to break it up? Yeah, so this is interesting. So the the government, when it is doing its job well, is making sure that the health of the industry is there. And what happens with a monopoly is like, so right now we are fighting with the fact that AT&T has a monopoly over the internet in my house. And for whatever reason, even Starlink doesn't work here. So now I'm in a position where it it is to the point where a very stable member of our team who we both know was threat. He said, at at the risk of your job, are you actually going to show up at this time? And they have put us off so many times, something like six months, where they will give us a day and a time, and then they just won't show up. It's absolutely outrageous. So that's what happens when you have a monopoly. And so the customer ends up suffering. And so what the government is saying is, hey, we're going to protect the consumer. Now, governments, I'll even grant them that governments have the best interests of their people at heart. The problem is these are incredibly complicated systems, and governments are far more likely to do harm most of the time than good when they think from the top down they can control this. Now, I'm not a libertarian. I do think we want government, but you need a constraining force. So the government right now is trying to be a constraining force against Google getting too monopolistic. I think we should be very slow to encourage the DOJ to do this, but upon seeing all the evidence and really weighing in and being very slow to do this, yes, you do want them to uh, protect the, the, 
the customer at the end of the day, but I think they should be very slow. Now I'm not in the weeds on the Google situation. Um, so I can only give you at a high level, uh, when you start seeing a rash of these anti-monopolistic suits go up, my spidey senses go off, but we haven't, like, it's not been crazy where I get worried is how much of the M and a that they're, um, they're really putting a cold blanket on all of that. And so where M&A should be taking 90 days, 120 days, you're now talking two, three years. Wow. And you just, the, the burden that that puts on companies, I think is terrifying. You want companies to be able to go, hey, we've stalled out. We wanna go get a strategic acquire here to continue to grow. It's good for the stock market. It can be good for that company. And so right now that's where I have a bigger problem is if Google were trying to make an acquisition and they're throwing cold water on that because they've been doing that over and over and over, I think that's a huge mistake. But whether Google really is just through um, owning so much of the world becoming a problematic monopoly, I'd have to look closer at it. Copy. And do you think this is something that happened a bit too late with the rise of ChatGPT, TikTok, a lot of other quote unquote search engines are out there. People are getting their information from different places. I mean, that's a really good question. And this yeah. is why I always hesitate to get behind um, the government stepping in and doing this. Just today, uh, I had a weird notice pop up on my screen. And instead of going to Google, which I would have done literally for the last 20 plus years, I just went to ChatGPT and was like, hey, this popped up, what do I do? And I thought, woof, if I'm going there just for information, I'm not even, um, it's not something where I wanted to write something for me or create something. I'm just like, hey bro, I'm like, ha, I have a feeling you're gonna know the answer to this. And its answer was so compelling and so concise and it didn't make me go dig, right? Cause a lot of times they'll send you to a web page, and you have to figure out where on the web page it is. It was just like, yo, this is what it means. And the answer was so bang on um, that I thought, woof, things are about to change in a, in a massive way. So again, this is why you want a very light touch government. You wanna make sure that as much of this is left to the free market as humanly possible. You wanna be able to point very specifically to a problem that doesn't that isn't already in the middle of a transition. So I think to your point about search, search is in the middle of a transition right now. And so I know that Google owns YouTube, but whether that's going out to YouTube, whether that's going out to all the different AIs, whether that's going out to X, like there, there is a diffusion of that happening right now as we transition into social media and as we transition into AI. And I think AI will literally obliterate what search is today. I think you're literally gonna have that friend around your neck or something like that, that you just have an interaction with all the time from the time that you're a kid, it will remember you and the things that you care about. And so now that search has so much context that it's like, oh, Tom, don't worry. I know um, in context what that warning on your particular screen means because I know what you've been up to. Copy. And honestly, that's the future that we want. So I'm, I'm curious well, to see where now it goes. privacy people in the feed are going ballistic because it, so everything is about tension. If you wanna understand the way that I view the world, mm -hmm. it, it really is tension between two things mm -hmm. because everything is a trade-off. There, there is no utopia. So it's, you will get bitten in the ass by the fact that you're being monitored all the time. And you're gonna have to, all of us are gonna have to answer the question, is it worth it? Is it worth the trade-off of having somebody that knows me better than myself, that reads all my emails, understands all the context, knows where I'm supposed to be at a given time and warns me and all that but you really are gonna trade something. And if the government is able to dip into that background, bro, it, it, the surveillance state is gonna get scary. It's very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. As you stated earlier, Kamala did her rounds from the Call Her Daddy to 60 Minutes edit. We'll get into that. Um, Mark Cuban on the All In podcast. What's your general reaction to this new political landscape? Because I'm so used to seeing two old guys argue on CNN for two hours. So seeing people on podcasts, laughing and, and joking with hosts, it, it feels a bit different. I think it's a better thing, but I, I kind of want your perspective. It's a better thing because yeah. you're getting longer answers, but the reality is watching this latest round with Kamala Harris, uh, and you see it a lot with Trump as well. This, this is very much on both sides. You want a confrontational interview. Again, friction, friction is the answer. And if you're going on, and obviously Trump and Harris are both gonna pick the places that they think are gonna be friendliest, that are gonna be kindest. And so yes, it's better than like these quick sound bites, but honestly, I would rather a 12 minute interview with an antagonistic journalist who is sincere, so not somebody who's um, just sort of anti that person. Like you want somebody who is in good faith saying, um, hey, I just wanna understand exactly where you stand. 
And because politicians are so good, you become a politician because you are the master of the frame. And if I can shout out Harris, she has done a phenomenal job, man, a phenomenal job. Four years ago, she was horrific on the debate stage, absolutely horrific. And seeing her now be able to do all the political maneuvering, which I despise, but it is the game. It's a skill. And she's yeah. gotten very good at it. So anyway, as a long form person, I want to see people go on the long form shows, but I want to see them embrace that friction. But this really is a game of, of controlling the narrative. And so I don't know that podcasting will solve the problem. And this is... I think this is probably a once journalism broke down and it became an advertising model and now they had to do things to appease advertisers to drive clicks. Uh, we may have broken something fundamental and podcasting won't get us back to that if people don't go on shows that could possibly not not only could possibly be antagonistic, they should be fair, they should be journalistic, but they should 100% try to actually get to what you understand. Or, or to understand your views. And I think everybody rightfully criticizes Kamala Harris for that. It's like, what, what do you actually believe? And love Trump or hate him. And I actually, I really don't like the bombast. That makes me very uneasy on a world stage. It's obviously divisive internally as well. But you know what he thinks? Like he just comes out and says it. Sometimes like to a like to, to a fall. the eyebrows like going <laughs> back not long past my forehead into yeah. the neighbor's backyard uh kind of thing but at least that feels unscripted i'm with you i thought it was going to solve the issue because i seen the 60 minutes edit where the unedited version there's a lot of ums i think as she's kind of dodging a question mm. and then the re-edited version she seems decisive and answers the question in five seconds. So yeah. we can see that the mainstream media is kind of getting exposed, whether it's this or the Joe Rogan clip that MSNBC modified a couple months ago. Oof. So we already see this happening, but I'm now realizing it even on the independent stage. And I'm going talking about Cuban on the All In podcast where he's even saying like he's even getting caught like he's just playing the game. She's doing what she's supposed to do. Bro. And you thought that on the independent side, you would at least be honest. But we're even all we're already seeing those chinks in the armor on the independent side as well. Okay, so there's two things there. There's is independent media gonna be the solve? And again, I think it's a way better format. So love that. Yeah. But, but the candidates have to go that. on ones where people are gonna push them. They've gotta be willing to do that, but it's risky. And so now you're into the kayfabe of it all. And this is something that really bothers me. And I really stare into the abyss of as somebody who is trying to use first principles thinking, like I literally, that is my life. You well know as we work together. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is how I navigate the world, everything that we do in business, everything that I do in my personal life, my marriage, all of it is governed by first principles thinking. But at the same time, I understand that it is very easy to manipulate people. Mm -hmm. And if that didn't make me feel sinister on the inside, I would do it because it's so effective. And so this is what um, Cuban was talking about. And look, I think Cuban's amazing, man. And I'm actually really blown away by what he's doing with um, cost plus drugs. So as with all things, mixed bag. So where I think he has landed is he kept talking about low information voters. There's high information voters. I actually don't think he said low information. There's high information voters. And he was like, basically, you have to ignore them. Uh, anybody that's going to listen to a long form podcast is going to parcel this stuff out. That's going to go and do research. You don't have to worry about those because most people don't fit into that category. And so I'm going to ask this question in a really blunt manner. What do you do about dumb voters? That's the game. So I want to strip away and look, I get it. I'm going to be clipped out of context. I want everyone to understand. I'm perfectly willing to accept that mm -hmm. I may be in the dumb voter camp, but that is the game. The game is what do you do about the fact that you have people that are not going to think through these issues, even if they're willing to, they're not going to. And then there are some people that legitimately cannot think through these issues, but they can vote. And so what do you do about the dumb voter problem? And right now, everybody lies. They control the frame and they don't tell you what they really think. I mean, you can see them dancing around it. They don't tell you what they really think. And they do this incredibly effective thing where they reframe what they really want to talk about instead of answering your question directly. And it, it will always be. I'm never going to be able to change it. All I can do is be sort of one little thing over here. Um, but it works. And people will always do what works. And people have to understand that what's happening is people are exploiting the fact mm -hmm. that many people do not have the intellectual horsepower to think through this stuff, perhaps myself included. And 
many people, even if they have the horsepower, they're not going to allocate the time. And the whole game is predicated on that. That's so dark, man. Like that really freaks me out. And the more that I get into this and the more that I accept the mantle of being somebody who is an independent uh, voice in a space where people are going to use my content in order to navigate the world, you start thinking, okay, do I give them a nuanced position? Because if I do, it's not going to perform as well. Like I can see behind your eyes right now, you're already editing me because you know that I've been talking too long. But that really is troubling. But is there a responsibility there that somebody has to be the the straight guy in the room like i understand that there's dumb voters and i understand that some people will get their political advice from their favorite celebrity but where where does that mantle fall who's the one that says hey guys you should actually be educated hey guys these are the actual issues we should voting for and it's i feel like gonna that, it's, it's not going to matter i don't even think that exists right now dude it, it wouldn't matter hey everybody you need to get educated you need to think through these problems <laughs> there i've said it but it it really won't matter no one is going to do it that wasn't already going to do it and the reason is this stuff is obscenely complex these are incredibly complicated systems but the problem is it really does matter mm -hmm. so the idea that i keep coming back to so my life philosophy boys and girls we are all automata that free will is an illusion but despite that, Drew, despite that, we respond to ideas. Mm -hmm. And so now it's like, I have the chills. We have to accept, even if you'll join me in believing that we're all automata, we're still gonna respond to the ideas that get, bef that get put before us. So the ideas then really matter. And a whole part of this complicated thing is that we all have these um, internal values that we steer by. We do things that we want to, um, I, for one, value integrity. So if I say something, then I'm gonna live up to what I say, that I'm not going to present one face and then be a different way. Literally, I can feel my brain scanning right now to make sure that what I'm saying is true, mm -hmm. to determine how I should feel about myself when I'm by myself. Okay, but everybody has different values. And so this is like that mid-curve thing where people are over here are just like, lie to everybody. And then the midwits like me are like, no, don't, like say the truth, nuance matters. And then you get back over here and it's like, eh, just lie to everybody because eh, it's what works. Dark, man. Dark, dark dude. Dark. <laughs> it's so dark. And so, look, I'm only ever going to be one pebble. And so I might as well be the the best pebble I can. I don't know why I'm calling it a pebble. But uh, you're, you're a grain of sand on a gigantic beach and people are going to encounter all the grains of sand and they're going to make their own decision. Um, it's dark. Man. Poly market, for those that don't know, that's the betting market on the election. There are people who sports bet and there's people who bet who's going to win the debate, who's going to win the swing state, etc. The poly market has tipped in Trump's favor. What's your gut telling you about who's actually going to win this election? Trust the poly market. And the problem is the poly market is going to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that um, what does my gut say? My gut says that. My gut says that I don't know. That, that's the honest answer. Really? So I will give you that uh, because I probably have a negativity bias and because I am so scared of mm -hmm. her um, fiscal policies that my default is like, oh my God, she's gonna win. Um, but that comes from a place of, okay, you can trust me to be selfish. You can trust everyone to be selfish. Mm -hmm. I sell to the middle class, I make entertainment. So forget what you guys know me for on YouTube. That is not what I think of as myself. What I think of as myself is what we're doing on the entertainment side. I make a video game. Um, I think a lot about that. And so there just aren't enough rich 11 to 15 year old kids for me to make that my market. So I care deeply about who do I think is actually going to build a thriving middle class. Now, I frame it that way only so that people understand, like even if you just trust me to be cynical and selfish, you can still trust that I actually care about the middle class, um, but I also just care about people in general. So my North Star is human flourishing for as many people as possible. That just means from a math equation, it's the middle class. I mean, that's, that's who you have to care about. Um, and then history teaches me that the middle class literally and the lower class, they will murder the upper class if there is not, and I, I don't mean that figuratively, I mean they actually come and decapitate you. Eat the rich. Uh, correct. If you don't make sure that the policies are good for them. So uh, to me, I'm looking at this going, who's gonna be better for the middle class? And unfortunately, the narrow ass margin is probably because eh, they're both gonna spend so crazy. <laughs> 
And what you really need is somebody to rein in the deficit. That's the actual answer. Neither of them are going to do it. Uh, but in Trump's four years, inflation was lower than Biden's. He's better on the border. That's the that's how I'm coming at this problem. Gotcha. I think that people will be a little better under Trump than Harris. I don't know. The I, I don't really trust betting platforms because, like you said, they shift with culture. So if the Call Her Daddy It'll interview change, yeah. did 2 billion views, I feel like that number would have flipped immediately. It might flip eight more times before yeah. we get to the election. So, But seven point, like a 7% difference is significant. We're, he's, we're used to the 2 to 3%, you know, margin of error kind of leads. But this seems like it's a bit different. The culture, the tides of culture may be changing. Um, quick well, pause. See, I so wish I knew what people were picking up on. What is it? that's happening. Is it that finally there's that groundswell of we don't know her? Is it she's really bounced back and forth? Is it that um, what Trump is doing in the swing states from an advertising campaign is actually working? In California, we don't even hear about this stuff, man. Yeah. Because here it's like, we are voting for Harris. Like yeah. just simple as every California electoral vote is going to Harris. You can pretty much guarantee it. Uh, so but I hear that what he's doing, like he's really on the offensive. I think so it's a, it's it's a mix working. from the super friends of Elon Musk, RFK, Tulsi the Gabbard, all these people that are kind of gathered around him. I think the fact that he was on a podcast from Flagrant to Dave Ramsey to Logan mm. Paul, where those are three different demographics in three different locations across the mm. U.S. Um, so I do say that Trump, from a campaigning standpoint, is doing something unique and new. And that kind of might be breaking the mold a little bit where the internet is now starting to rally in a way that we didn't expect. It was like, oh yeah, the young people like Trump, like Democrats, period. They TikTok, that's all we need to do, we're good. Whereas mm -hmm. I think Trump is going to these independent media pockets that we kind of loop in as the internet or, oh, those are those Rogan bros, we don't need to ignore them. But there are a lot of people in that pocket. There are a lot of people in that swell. And with all these people that loved RFK that are sad that he dropped out, they're now migrating over there. Mm -hmm. People hate what's happening in the wars. We have somebody that was endorsed by Dick Cheney, which I feel like isn't the flex that the Democrats think it is. Bro. So it, it's 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 getting really really weird, and and I think that's where the the, the brain is breaking. Um, but I'm with you. I can't call it. Uh, it's it's up in the air. Yeah, um, and it'll bounce back and forth, even though we have less than a month. It's crazy. Bananas. You want to get freaked out? From the time that we're recording this. It is less than three weeks till we relaunch our Christmas video game. That's how close we are to the season, man. It's bananas. Sheesh. Bananas. Just, it goes fast. It goes fast. Oh, I man. know. Do your Christmas shopping early, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Meta just released their Orion headset. Mm. I feel like it's what Google Glass wanted to be. It's what Apple Vision Pro Quest is gathering to. Like all these different technologies, it seems like Meta hit it out the park. What do you think? Yeah, I think people should go on X right now and plant your flag and say whether this is ridiculous or whether you think this is going to be something. It is. And look, I'm obviously making a bet with my own credibility, but I'm telling you right now, this is the future for sure. They're like people are like, nah, it's not going to be the form factor. I think it was Chamath Polyhapatia yeah. that said it won't be the glasses form factor. What? Obviously, it's going to be something on your eyes. So yeah. if it isn't glasses, it's going to be contact lenses. I mean, it is going to be around your eyes. We navigate the world with our eyes, period, full stop, end of story. So whatever's going to happen is going to have a form factor that is around your eyes and making it small, making it something that people are already used to 100%. And I will see people make comments where I'm like, what world do you live in? Why do we need this? Why do we? Wh what? Dude, imagine someone walking up to you and you're like, oh God, I recognize their face. And it just whispers, the last time you saw this person was this, this is their name. That's better. You literally just got smarter. Or imagine looking at that building. What is that building? Well, I'm glad you asked. And like in the Terminator, it will pop up. You'll know exactly what it is. Have you guys not played video games where it sees something you don't and it locks on and it's like, yo, this person that's 100 yards from you, you know who they are. And this is where you know them from and all that. It's like, guys... If, like me, you have ever thought to yourself, I wish I were a little smarter, guess what happens when you put the glasses on? You get a little bit smarter. This is nuts to me that people are like, I don't know if this is really going to happen. The only question is, how quickly will they be able to get it to the point where it's light enough on your face that you can wear it all day, that it's not melting your brain, and that it's affordable because right now the prototypes like ten thousand dollars a unit that's to make Jeez. so then they're gonna sell for twenty thousand yeah. i mean so they obviously have to get the form factor changed so that they can afford to mass produce this stuff but i mean is that five years away it's not a lot more than that so dude if they were available right now 
I would buy one for sure, without question. Now they look a little silly. You look like Eugene Levy, but man, to literally take that next step forward with non-invasive cyborg abilities, uh, yes, please. Like imagine for a second, dude, it's like, do these people not play video games? <laughs> you could, they could make it such that you could do an infrared overlay. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that yeah. you could do. Dude, this is all available right now. These technologies are available today and you could, read the world in infrared, you could do night vision. I mean, look, I'm obviously now throwing the price into the <laughs> stratosphere, but getting people to understand that you navigate mm -hmm. the world through your eyes and your ears, it will do both. It's just absurd to think that this isn't on the path to being one of the most transformative technologies uh, in a long time. It, it will be eclipsed by AI. AI will be more important, but AI will be integrated into it. AI will help you read the world. It's crazy. And that's where I think the technology is going there. You can't put it back in the bottle. And it, I was actually surprised that it took them this long. I know Snap came with their partnership with Ray-Ban mm -hmm. of just like, you can photo anything. But I think this form factor actually makes more sense, especially in the business context. I've seen that he was in a meeting and a text message popped up and he was talking to his wife in the middle. So it's those things that's like, yes, that would be convenient. But I don't know, is this like, do we need Do we need this? Yes, man, all of the things that you just listed are all the dumb things that I will tell people, turn them <laughs> off. You don't wanna be in a conversation with somebody and have a text message pop up, that's ass. I don't wanna talk to you when you're like texting with your wife and shit, it's like, <laughs> stop. I wanna be with you when I'm with you. Mm. But when you're engaging with the world and it's mm. reading things, you. like, okay, let's give a crazy example. The AI, uh, let's say that you're on the spectrum and the AI is like, I got you. And it's like, no, 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 they just made a micro expression. I suggest that you ask the question, hey, is everything okay? Did I just say something that bothered you? Hey, is everything okay? Did I just say something? Well, I'm glad you asked, right? I mean, it, dude, there are gonna be some people that reject it. I get it. There are gonna be, there will be a new Puritan movement where the purity is about the rejection of technology. I fully understand that. I'm not even mad at them because I get it. There, this is gonna be a trade-off, yeah. but just like you can have an unhealthy relationship with food or you can eat to not only survive but thrive, it will be the same with technology. If you use it to be constantly distracted, to indulge in pornography or whatever, then yeah, it, it will be worse. It will have moved you backwards. But if you have a healthy relationship with it, then it's gonna be extraordinary, man. Mm -hmm. Like if, if we did a podcast just on this, I could spend two hours just walking you through all the things I've already thought of and the odds that I've thought of half of a percent of the things that it will do are virtually zero. So um, phones have made some people's lives worse, but not mine. So this becomes a question That's of a what point. is your relationship with it? It's a very good point. Very good point. Are you ready for your Tesla surprise? Let's do it. I want to hear about it. So Tesla is set to announce tonight the cyber cab. It is their response to Waymo, Google's uh, self-driving oh, taxi service. So this is supposed to go live. They're literally doing it at the Warner Brothers Theater in Hollywood. What's your first thoughts? Uh, obviously, like this is the way. It'll just be a competition between all these different car companies. None of us are ever gonna drive. I understand that that's gonna traumatize a lot of people that love driving and I cool, hey, go do it as a, you know, a hobby. I love that. But the reality is for me, being in a car that I'm not driving is like teleporting because I can just put my head down and get work done, <laughs> do whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. Like I don't understand people um, for whom they would rather do the act of driving, especially because I live in LA, so the traffic's terrible. It's not like the wind is blowing through your hair. Uh, you're stuck in traffic. Um, so for me, just being able to learn, that's what I'm normally doing, or mm -hmm. I'm just getting work done is, is utterly transformative. So now we all get that time back, but also it will be so much safer. It will be orders of magnitude safer. All the cars will be able to pot up. They will understand what each of them are doing as regulations begin to get passed that force them to communicate with each other mm -hmm. uh, and say, you know, up, oh, we've detected a, a car is moving erratically or whatever. It's probably this, that, or the other. Um, and then you might be able to have all, if, if enough cars send back a kill signal, then it shuts the vehicle down or something like that. I mean, just guys, these are the, the things you can think of quickly off the top of your head. Like it's, it's just going to be so much better. Now where people begin to push back is bro, I want the autonomy. Cool. I hear you. And I think that there is a very reasonable debate. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you're probably in like 10 years, you're probably going to have a hard time getting insurance, but 
that's the only side of this where I'm like, yeah, I'm empathetic to that. There are people that just, but those are the things that I want to do. And I want to make sure that they have that space. Uh, but for safety reasons, that being relegated to a track or to given spaces, personally, I'm here for that. So it immediately reminded me of like horseback riding and how everybody used to own a horse and everybody used to ride. And now there are people who still ride horses, but they're in these remote specific areas where everybody else drives. Yep. So, and I'm sure that yeah. that was legitimately traumatizing to a subgroup of people. And I get it. Everything's a trade-off. I'm a car guy though, so that makes me sad. But we'll see what's I trust Elon Musk though. Everybody loves a Tesla. So I'm curious to see how he his take on the cyber cab versus the Waymos and all these mm. other ones. So should be interesting. As a video game developer, Concordia, Sony's horrific uh latest project yeah. that rumored to lose over four hundred million dollars. Oh, no surprise. Game dev to game dev, what's the eulogy? I just want, you understand this more than a lot of other people, so I just thought you should give this kind of eulogy to Sony. Right. To Sony, <laughs> if I may, can we please have your assets? Uh, here is, here's the reality of the entertainment industry, and I am trying, I'm, I'm running a test to see if there's a way to buck that, because you see this in movies, and for me, video games is a way to escape this. So what happens in a movie is you get one shot to get people excited and behind it. Now, every now and then something will then go to streaming or video back in the day and it would get a cult audience. So for example, Shawshank Redemption absolutely tanked at the box office. I did not know that. Wow. And it has gone on to be considered the greatest film of all time. It, it is a truly extraordinary film that now a lot of people have seen, but at the time it was just an abject failure. And so you see that a lot and it's done. And so now whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen and no one's gonna put marketing dollars into it or anything like that. But I think the world has changed. So here's what I'm betting on. If I can build a gaming community, and by the way, if you're into video games and empowerment, join me 6.30 a.m. Pacific time most days where I stream uh, playing Fortnite and Project Kaizen, our game. Um, if I can build an audience that's around that idea, right? They wanna be there for empowering ideas and video games at the same time. Now I can build the game in public and it will ebb and flow. And there'll be times just like our YouTube channel where we're way up and then there's times where the channel comes back down and we reinvent and we try new things. And so you just get this like constant rock and we've built this incredible business around it. I think video games, unlike a film, which really, because it's static, mm -hmm. it is what it is. And so if people don't like it, you're done. So if you spent $200 million making a movie and another 200 million marketing it and people don't like it, that's it. There's no going back and redoing it. A game isn't like that. A game you can reinvent, you can try, you can create new mechanics. So Fortnite, one of the biggest games on planet Earth, uh, originally was like the saying where you're killing zombies and all this stuff. and they were like reinventing it constantly. They had like redone the art style three times. They'd redone the core mechanics a bunch. And they were like, oh God, did we release this? And then right as they're releasing it, they see that PUBG is just crushing it with this new thing called a battle royale. So as an afterthought, someone inside the team was like, give us a small budget and let us take all these assets, all the stuff that we've built because it's a video game. For people that don't understand how this works, all of that stuff can be tweaked a little bit. And then the outcomes are wildly different. Mm. So basically what you've done is create Call it physics. That's pretty close to what you're doing. How big is a jump? How far is a jump? Um, what is it like when you slide? How does the gun react? All that stuff. It, it's an insane amount of work. But once you set all that up, then you can make minor tweaks. Like, hey, instead of one person goes in and fights a bunch of the zombies, what if using all the same mechanics, we drop in a hundred of the players and have them kill each other? All the same physics, all the same maps. Ah. And now all of a sudden you have a totally different game and it ends up taking off and becoming one of the biggest video games of all time. But the zombie killing part is still out. It's still available. Virtually nobody plays it, but it's the same underlying game. Yeah. So you had a game that took, let's say, five or six years to develop. And at the last minute, they switched it up. And that switch up ended up creating a totally oh, different no. game. So when I see Sony go, nah, fuck it, and they turn it off, I'm just like, what are you doing? go in there, figure out with all these assets, what other thing could we do? Because what they're looking at is the cost of the servers to run this, the marketing team, all that, nah, we just don't wanna deal with it. So as an indie dev, legitimately, if companies like that would put their assets up for sale, oh my God, please, like that's the part of all this that is so expensive and takes so much time. But of course they won't because they would look like a fool if I can take those assets and do something with it, and so they'd rather just spike it. It, it is, it is devastating from the outside. It's the very thing I'm hoping to avoid. If the first iteration of our game, the first iteration of our game did fail. And so we reinvented it and we reinvented it again. And now we're on what we call phase three. 
phase three starting to get some traction, mm-hmm. but phase three was never meant to be where we stopped. Well, phase four or five, six, seven, eight. And I just plan to keep, keep costs as low as I can and keep going until I find that thing that boom, that clicks because we've done the hard and expensive part. So anyway, for a company as big as Sony, they can afford to do it. But I really think if indie game devs adopt the live update, which most of them don't, but if you adopt a live update strategy, I think you've got a shot at something that could live forever as you leverage everything that you've built over and over and over and over until you find that thing that hits. 100%. And you kind of nailed it on the head because they had big wins in the past. They have the Sony IP. There's all these other... And just them being a studio, to your point, it's like the Joker movie. We shot it. It's a musical. Nobody likes it. Ah, we're stuck. We can't do anything. We're yeah. to a game. You, now you have a library of content, library assets, all these devs. And it's just like, sorry, guys. Like, let's start all over now and just... It's bananas. $400 million L, man. Crazy. Yup. Um, okay. After 220 confirmed deaths after Hurricane Helen, Hurricane Milton just made landfall in Florida. It's now traveling through. Some estimates have up to nine feet of water. Is this like a climate change problem? Like nine feet of water is crazy to me. And I'm from Jersey. I've been through Sandy. I, like we had bad power outages and a couple of broken trees, but like nine feet of water, like that's, it's, it's not real. It doesn't, it's crazy. Nine feet of water is legitimately crazy. So the baseline that I would want people to accept is that the climate is always changing. It has been changing since the time of the dinosaurs and I'm sure long before that. Uh, But when you drill into the ice cores, you realize we've had way more extreme weather than we're having now. But that doesn't make it fun to deal with. So there is a huge cost to um, infrastructure. There's a huge cost to human life, the knock on to insurance and all that stuff. It's it's a pain to deal with. But on a long enough timeline, a thousand percent, you are going to be dealing with climate change basically no matter what you do. Good luck overcoming the forces of nature. On a long enough timeline with AI, might we finally grapple with this? Maybe. But my takeaway right now is if you look at a graph of the temperatures from the time that you know the dinosaurs were here, it's like way up here. We are way the hell down here now. Um, however, you see this like not vertical, but woo, it is like a line that does not look natural. So mm-hmm. I think that Elon summed it up best when he was like, hey, kids maybe running an experiment of what happens if we pump a ton of CO2 into the atmosphere. Maybe that's a stupid (laughs) test to run. So I would agree. And I think that we want to find ways to eliminate however much of the um, climate change that we're experiencing now has to do with us, um, that we want to mitigate that as much as we can without disrupting Uh, economic growth without disrupting the countries that are still trying to climb their way out of poverty. It does feel very much like the current strategies of it's got to happen right now, like no matter what. And that to me is crazy. If you are not optimizing for human flourishing now and in the future, Mm -hmm. then you've got a problem. And right now I feel like people like, hey, forget everybody that's alive right now. Uh, Let's just think about what's happening in the future. And also, and this is where I'm going to get up on a nuclear soapbox, bro. If you're not doing nuclear, like don't talk to me about some of the other um, draconian solutions that you want to put in place. Focus on how do we make that as safe as humanly possible? How do we get those back online? If we put the ingenuity into it, I think that we could get a ton out of it. And then also other things, but doing it in a sensible way where Uh, Governments have time to keep up with it, that we're making sure that we're not damaging the economy, that we're not making things worse because very much you can have a cure that's worse than the malady. So um, I think that we have to tread very carefully here, be thoughtful, want that friction. Don't just try to shut down the side that's like, hey, I think you guys might be being a little extreme here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Don't try to shut that side down, except that, that the people that are alive now today, the people that are trying to climb out of poverty using energy today, they matter just as much as the people that we want to protect in the future. 100%. And so we've got to say, okay, cool. I want that friction. I want to be held in check. Like I don't want just capitalists being able to dump things in the water and like pump everything into the atmosphere. I want them to have a check. So it's like you want that friction between the two sides to find the best way forward. And once people understand that the friction is the thing that sharpens your thinking, nobody there, nobody has the, the first idea and that's the best idea. Even Einstein ended up having to revise his own philosophies, right? Mm-hmm. You put it out into the world, you test it experimentally, you see what's actually working, what's not. 
that sharpens your thinking when you're not afraid to be wrong. And then you can actually get to a good answer. But right now, when it becomes this cudgel where it's a moral thing and anybody that's like, oh, I'm not so sure about that. And I think that there are trade-offs and we need to really be thoughtful. And they get silenced, deplatformed, whatever. Like literally just by talking about this, we're probably going to get a thing at the bottom of the episode. So keep your eyes peeled for that. <laughs> uh, and that I think is dangerous. You need to want debate. There's something about that with energy costs, because I do think your point is valid. Nuclear can greatly reduce that. Um, I think Elon talked about half a couple acres of solar panels using the sun can power half of the United States. So it seems like we have these technologies, one available to us and relatively cheap, quote unquote, that we can get away from our dependencies of traditional fossil fuels. But at the same time, we're not pursuing that, but we also want to make other people not pursue other. And so to your point, it's like we're we're trying to push us in one direction, but not too fast. But we're also not going backwards. Not too. So it's like we, they want us to be stuck in the middle almost. It's very confusing. I think there might be something else happening where uh, this. OK, now we're into complicated territory. So uh, my conspiratorial brain starts kicking in and I, like I don't go. have a strong conspiratorial mind. So when it gets triggered, there's something going on. Um, I think that the world, humans, are only understandable when you know that there is some portion of us tied to Nietzsche's idea of will to power. So mm -hmm. all of us have a will to power. And it can be just in our personal life. And this is why home life is so important to so many people. It's a place where, hey, you're going to have it the way that you want it. Um, but when you understand that part of what motivates people is not just, hey, I want the world to be better for the middle class, or I want to make sure that our children's children have clean air to breathe. But they also just want a bit of power. And this is why this is part of the what do you do with dumb voters? So my belief, just to give you my take, you have to let dumb voters vote and you have to accept that whatever comes, comes. Because anything else becomes tyranny. And I get it. All of us are like, there are people much smarter than me that are traumatized that I get to vote or that I get to speak into a camera. Like they're mortified. They're like, what's with this clown? Uh, and so all of us have somebody that has less thoughtfulness or less intellectual horsepower that we're horrified that they get to vote. Uh, but so that we are not silenced, we must leave it open for everybody and just accept that, yeah, human um, personalities, intellect, willfulness, all of it, it's, it's a distributed, it's, it's a bell curve. And so, yeah, it is what it is. And I, for one, believe you need to embrace that. And you want to put out the best ideas and you want that friction. You want to debate it, argue it and get as sharp as we can. Uh, but you really have to accept that you are so fallible mm -hmm. that you should be ultra paranoid of control. Now, this is one no one will ever believe you no matter what you say, unless you really like took me to task. But I try to run my company that way, where there are times where I'll say, look, I'm saying this is a CEO and it's just going to be this way because we've debated it and you do finally need somebody to make a decision. But I don't trust myself. I don't trust myself to see around every corner. I don't trust myself to be right all the time. Um, I think my intellect is limited and I think I need to surround myself with smart people that have my values on that. I've found if, if you have different values or a different aim, that's you're going to implode. But I want people that share my values, that share my vision but see the world from a different angle. And so they can see things about me that I can't see about myself, or they might argue a point and be like, yo, that's not the way. And then through that friction, you're able to find a path forward. So when you understand will to power and you know that most people aren't willing to give it away, um, then things start to make sense. These are people that I think are leveraging a crisis. It's a great quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. Now, when somebody lives by that maxim and they have the will to power, now all of a sudden something like COVID becomes, oh, we can gobble up power. And once we have it, we don't have to give it back because people acclimate to it very quickly. And so if you plug that variable in, now all of a sudden I don't trust that people are just trying to do what's right. I think they're using this as an opportunity to get control. And mm. uh, top-down control scares the life out of me. No, that, that, that hits it. That hits it. All right. DC has announced their new Green Lantern, Aaron Paul. He was in that Ridge movie in Netflix, uh, a relatively new actor. If you could be any superhero, who would you be? Ooh, okay. Well, I'll give you the answer that came to mind first. Dr. Manhattan. 
Now, I'd probably want to think about that more because there was something, it ruined all of his relationships. And that is the thing that scares me. But I've always believed if you meet a magic genie and you are allowed to have one wish and one wish only, there is only one wish that makes sense through simple thoughts and actions to be able to turn any piece of matter into any other piece of matter. So for instance, uh, if you have a cancerous tumor, make it healthy tissue. I don't wanna have to go in and like figure out which things are <laughs> cancer or not. I just wanna be like, it's not cancer anymore, it's healthy tissue. Uh, Dr. Manhattan comes very, very close to that. Um, so that's, that's my answer. Part B, is it like, that's who you would be or is that your favorite superhero? That's who I would want to be. My favorite superhero is Batman because he doesn't have any superpowers other than uh, he trains and researches. And that to me is the coolest of the cool. Um, so at Impact Theory, in our comic division, we often, you know, in comics, you're going to be dealing with superhero E type of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing we always wanted was the superhero has to earn their powers. Mm -hmm. So the I wish. In fact, every night I am tempted to punch myself in the mouth because I did not create My Hero Academia. Uh, it's so good, dude. And it's basically about a kid who becomes Superman, but he has to learn how to use the powers and how to build up like his strength and get his body to the point where it can tolerate the powers. It's unbelievable. So even a story like that, where it's like you are just get, he ate this guy's hair. It's a terrible origin story. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he gets the powers mm -hmm. and then like finds that the powers are basically destroying him and he doesn't know how to control it and he can damage himself and be near death and all that stuff. And so it's like, hey kid, you've got this power, but now you've got to earn it. Oh man, I love that so much. That's why the Batman mythology speaks to me. Copy, my favorite superhero is Spider-Man because he's the only superhero that pays rent. I think that that's important. Nice, it's he's also important. funny. He was my favorite as a kid because he was funny. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. If there's any topics that you wanna see me cover, make sure you go over to our community posts, leave it there, let us know. We are paying close attention there. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care, peace. If you like this conversation, check out this episode to learn more. The financial cliff that we're rapidly driving off uh, is, is pretty terrifying. Um, there, you know, it's not just the $35 trillion in debt or the fact that, um, that interest on the debt is now overtaking the budget.